Hi. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so, um, oh, this metro sounds very close by. Yeah, it is. Um, some extra sound effects today. Welcome. It's been an amazing time. Um, literally, uh, we've been making this film for about 10 years, and little did we know that it would come out at a time that's. Uh, that's literally just, the world has gone mad. And uh, we are so sorry that our co-lead, Oleg, uh, couldn't join us today. And he's still in Kiev defending his country. And, uh, and really can't even imagine what it's like for him at the moment. It's, uh, it's tough to imagine that, honestly. Being myself from originally from Estonia and uh, having grown up in Estonia, it's it's quite close to uh, Russia as well. But the story um, the story is not about politics. Uh, Sergei's wish was very clearly that we would make the story about love, and uh, I hope we did our best about it. We, we almost finished the film in 2020 and then had an extra year to edit and. Uh, cut seven minutes out of it. Seven minutes doesn't sound like much, but trust me, it's a much more streamlined film thanks to that. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't really like to say much before the film. I kind of like to let the film do its own work. It's been a real honor and a gift to be able to first be cast as the lead in the film um, and then assume the role of a writer, thanks to Peter's generosity, and then assume the role as a producer, and then on, 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 on. Um, but yeah, it's a real honor to open uh, here in New York, and really, uh, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge how blessed we are to be here in safety and comfort, and <laughs> <laughs> I so wish that was going to be a guest, Brian. Right. Yeah. There's so many people that could have been. <laughs> oh, Ole. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, just, just really to acknowledge that, that he is there and he would love, have loved to be here in spirit, so um, he is here in spirit. Uh, and yeah, without further ado, please do enjoy the film and please forget I have a British accent. Okay, so Q and A's always start with some like ponderous question, uh, but we wanted to turn it around today and flip it out to the audience first. We would love to know. Okay, well then, oh please, yes. you sort of were influenced by in putting the film together. Is that, that yeah, your question? Kind of like Great. <laughs> yeah, I could give you a bit of a mood board. Um, <laughs> there's moments and influence certainly from uh, Tom, uh, Tom Ford's debut film, A Single Man. That was massively influential for me actually when I was, I think it was about 18, 19 when it came out. And um, it changed filmmaking me actually that film um, made me actually really want to be a filmmaker so yeah even when we were writing the script um, the hangar scene where after the accident um, Sergei goes to find Romanica and it's all this blue lighting that just kind of came to me when we were, when we were writing even the colouring and kind of various choices so that was probably one of the biggest influences um, for me as, as a writer um, I dare to say even kind of like moments of like um, testament of youth in it. Um, another film would be even there's an element of Titanic in it. There's a little bit of Romeo and Juliet in there. Like this, this kind of quite an amalgamation. <coughs> but I'm sure Peter can fix it. Um, 
I don't think there's any film in it in terms of like, um, I remember reading one review last year which was like, oh, they have like copied uh, the ending of the port uh, of the lady, but the, the portrait, portrait of the lady of fire. Yeah. Uh, but sadly, we wrote the script quite a few years before that film came out. Uh, so they must have read our script. Um, but I think, as in terms of inspiration, in general, for me, there are probably three names that come to mind. First of all, uh, Stanley Kubrick. I absolutely adore how he found a different language for each of his films and then fall into this trap of speaking the same language for whatever the story is. Uh, secondly, definitely Wong Kar Wai, in terms of the use of light and color, which is amazing. And I think also Pedro Almodovar, I was actually excited to see that uh, our poster is next to his. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm going to turn back out there in a second, but I, I do think that brings up something really interesting, because you are taking on a real life story. Um, and uh, you know, how, how do you interpret that? How do you try to stay true to that? Um, were, there, uh, were there other real life stories that you're like, I need to, to look at that or I don't want to fall into that trap? Talk on me. <laughs> um, no, it, it's... Sergei's story that's, that's really the reason for making this film and after reading the original story it actually found me at the Berlinale Film Festival and uh, a friend of his who plays the drama professor in the film uh, was showing it around, he's a Russian film critic and uh, this, actually the drama professor wrote was originally meant for the real Sergei but sadly he passed away just before we started filming. Uh, so it was, it was really just trying to do our best to to tell the story to leave this memory. Yes, please. Was there any parallels that you drew with the ballet at the Firebird and the when you took the Vinsky or the Red of the Ballet and trying to tie into kind of the formatting of the film or or the or any parallels between the characters? If I'm 100% honest, which I should be, then it was the music first. It was really, we were looking for the piece of music, because in real life their favorite uh, thing was actually the Yevgeny uh, Onegin opera. But that didn't really ring true for the film. And we were looking for alternatives and you know, Swan Lake has been done 110 times, so that didn't feel very original. And somehow Firebird came up, and then I think after the music then was the relevance of the story of this uh, rebirth through the ashes, really. What's your feeling? Yeah, I think there's definitely a lot of parallels. Um, it's been interesting to read online, and people seem to make lots of parallels about who the Firebird is and what they do. Um, but yeah, it, it was kind of instrumental as a piece of music. Uh, I had to like separate myself from listening to that final track of music for quite a long time because it would actually send me into kind of quite a different place. Um, and I realized actually this, through this process of making the film actually quite how important film is and um, music is in the film. Yeah, actually that last shot is probably one of the most difficult ones technically because so you look at it on screen and say, oh cool, the camera is moving in. But in reality, it, because we didn't really have the funds to hire a technocrat, so it meant we built this huge crane on the stage of the theater, cleared up some chairs and put a camera on top of it, and then all of that on a dolly. So we had a dolly operator, a crane operator, a focus puller, camera operator, and DOP who had to actually get it technically right, so that we go from wide of the theater to extreme close-up, and then obviously Tom did an amazing job of actually going on an emotional journey for two minutes, and that's, yeah, that was... Uh, How many really times did you have to cry? There's quite a debate about whether we should even need the tears. Um, 
It was one person who I was going to remove from the set because they were trying to direct over Peter what the final shot should be like. And it wasn't me, I wasn't on set. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it, it's such a hard moment actually because I like my job as an actor is to you know tell the truth and show the truth, but also I'd like to do it in a way which hasn't necessarily been done before. And so, yeah, those tears which form at the end of that shot kind of almost came through me. I don't quite know how they did it quite that precisely because it was it's not manufactured. I'm not a, I'm not a method actor, um, and I can't cry on cue. Um, I actually just basically put my my trust and faith in that I've done my preparation and I just surrender to whatever happens. So that's the divide. Uh, there was actually no other direction in that scene than just remembering their time together. So it's whatever happened really was off to no chance. It was also actually very odd, I just remembered one thing that um, shooting that, and it's the take that we use actually, um, I experienced a very strange thing after playing that. It was like I was experiencing his life flashing before my eyes and their time together. It's almost like I was shown a real of everything that they had had an experience together. So it was, it was honestly like, it came out of that, I was like, what was that? That was, that was pretty terrific. I think you had, uh, I think it's important to sort of dig into another experience as an actor that was fairly unique on this, uh, around you and Oleg, because Oleg came to the set and basically knew no English. So, you know, how did you manage that, and develop that relationship, and what ended up an incredible chemistry? Yeah, well, when Oleg walked into the room in Moscow, uh, we just knew he was Roman, and we went on a long search, actually, and there was something like the quality about the way he held himself that we just knew was the closest thing that we'd found to Roman. There were no pictures of Roman anywhere, and so it was just really, like, what was the closest thing to uh, our imagination, and yeah, the, the, he was very good in the scenes, but it was like, okay, now we actually can't communicate, because I speak barely any Russian, and he didn't really speak much English at the time. So, yes, yeah, scaling that was pretty complicated, particularly when we've got quite emotional and, and quite physical, uh, uh, com like how comfortable you are with, you know, how much you want to show and be close to somebody. And I think he did an amazing job, but um, our hardest job, actually, as the writers, was to figure out um, dialogue for a time where the dialogue doesn't exist about how you scale such a relationship. And so it actually kind of, in a weird way, kind of became a blessing in disguise because we couldn't share that much with each other intellectually, but we shared a lot physically. And it was really about our physical space between each other um, and, and our rehearsal time together that allowed that kind of space and distance to kind of go beyond words. Beautifully done. Uh, I want to make sure we have time if anybody else has a question. Yes, please, in the back. And go ahead and speak loudly so we can, we can hear you. Hi, I have a question for Peter. Um, so why do the movie is not in the language of the country uh, of the true story? So this happened in the 70s, and the next and Estonia, right? So uh, why the movie was not in Estonian or in Russian? Yeah, that was actually a very conscious decision that we made at the beginning of the production. Um, first of all, it's set in Soviet occupied Estonia. Uh, of course, I always, always say not Soviet Union because uh, Russians also, and I don't mean really Russian because I have a lot of dear Russian friends, but uh, but let's say the Soviet state liberated Estonians also, like they are currently trying to liberate Ukrainians in a very similar fashion. Um, it was, I think, two major considerations. A, we wanted this film to be accessible. I don't think we would be here today if we had shot it in Russian. Um, I think uh, foreign language films sadly get very little uh, time in theaters and almost no time on TV or escort or TV. 
that was really the main consideration. But for a long time, we were discussing with Tom whether to do it in Russian or in English. And I think the last final decision was we visited uh, Radnyansky, the producer of uh, Leviathan and Loveless in Moscow. And he was like, why do you even consider doing it in Russian? And, uh, and kind of convinced us, really, uh, in order for the story to be actually seen around the world. And secondly, casting, uh, which we kind of had doubts whether we would be able to cast in Russia this story. And when we went out and actually started casting, we offered several supporting roles, and all of the uh, known great actors uh, turned it down, said privately that they loved the story, but they can't risk their career in Russia. Yes, also in the back. I have a question about uh, Roman White and his son. Have they seen the film? Do they know about the film? And have you had any, if so, have you had any reaction from them? And what has the reaction been? Uh, no, we were actually not able to track them down ever. And Sergei really was very, let's say, I think he still felt a bit bitterness over Luisa, and that's one of the main things we really changed compared to the original story and book that, uh, that we gave Luisa an equal voice and felt that uh, her tragedy and her perspective was as important, that she wasn't an obstacle to their love story. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. In the middle here. Today, this is considered like something that a lot of people sort of fight against, I guess, in the, in the fiction and media specifically. Um, you mean fight against uh, the discrimination of the LGBTQ community? Uh, I meant more like that once you depict the queer love story, People prefer it not to be a tragedy anymore, I guess. I, I would also prefer, honestly. Um, I think the sad thing is that uh, unless we change politicians and political systems, and speaking here even you know, of Florida, which kind of shocked me, and I, I first thought that I'm reading fake news online, um, unless we change the political system, we will sadly still have to make a lot of tragic LGBTIQ love stories in the future as well would love to make a happy ending, but uh, I think it would be it would be disrespectful uh, to Sergei's story. And, and really, the, the reality is that uh, their lives were destroyed by the system of the time. And that's, I think, one of the reasons also why All Out resonates with us so strongly that uh, it's, I think it's about time to fight for this really simple basic right that everyone can love uh, wherever they choose to. It, I'm going to make a comment in that too, and sorry to steal that from you, because I, I also think this story is a, about triumph, and um, ultimately, yes, there was a tragic moment, but Sergei came out, Sergei went after his dream, Sergei continued to live a life, the real life Sergei ended up acting, you know, so while that moment in that love story is tragic, somebody also came out of it triumphant. <clears throat> I think also just one thing to, to add as well is that I'm a great believer in um, when there's a problem, give it more love. And I think that goes a long way. Um, there's a lot of fighting. Uh, and I think when we give a problem more more love and actually more exposure, yeah, we would have loved to have a happy ending. And probably the biggest thing that I get written to on social media is like, why did you have to make it such a sad ending? And I'm like, it's a true story. <laughs> <laughs> and if, if we had written it otherwise, it wouldn't have been a service. And there is still a collective of people in Russia who believe that LGBTQIA plus people don't exist. Did he ever find love? <clears throat> Good question. The short answer is no. The longer answer, to be brief, is that he 
really tried to find love again like that, which was so all-encompassing, was so kind of um, defiant of when everybody else said that that wasn't okay or they couldn't do that. But no, he actually really struggled. Um, he did have other relationships, but he said he never found something quite as significant as that. I'm going to do a quick time check. Are we okay for another question? Are we wrapping it up? Yeah, three minutes. Three minutes? And please, after we move out of here, we'll be up in the lobby afterwards. So if you had a question or wanted to take time to, to talk to Tom and Peter, please, we're, we're more than happy to spend time with you. Is there another question we can answer? Oh, yes, please, right here. Um, so, Sergey died in 2017, and you've been, Sergey died in 2017, and you've been writing on a dating for the past 10 years. Was he part of the process at all? Yeah, we went to uh, Moscow for the first time in 2016 to meet him, um, which was honestly uh, incredible. Um, it really informed a lot of decisions about how we wrote the, score, uh, the script and also how we um, kind of defined the details, because in the original story, there's moments where it almost seems fantastical, like how on earth could this have happened? And so we really wanted to answer those questions. And then it really informed me because he was such a he was such a courageous man, like a very much a kind of beacon of light and hope in a in a world where even like when we met him it was still sort of very difficult to be himself. But I mean he was like openly flirting with a male waiter in a restaurant in a suburb of Moscow. <laughs> <laughs> and Peter and I were like, Well, okay, like and it was it was in a way that was so genuine and and um, yeah, he had a great deal of impact into more more for me personally about how I actually decided to play in the film. Um, there were many times where we removed actually a lot of um, self suffering in the film, which is kind of maybe a bit different than than kind of identity uh, uh, like finding your identity type stories because it can be a real struggle but he was even the photos that we saw when he was in the Soviet Union he was so expressive at the time you can kind of tell that he was at ease with himself with it but the system wasn't like the environment wasn't so that's really why I decided to play him in such a way and that was valuable for me to him. I, I think in general, the um, the one thing that we really tried our best was the authenticity of the time, and uh, we shot in 46 locations, like actual old remaining little buildings, and like a hangar here, a barracks here, fixing them up, and really using the actually authentic places where the Soviet uh, army used to be located. And also the score recording, for example, uh, we did in the Prague Philharmonic Hall, which I symphony orchestra live for a day, so the music would sound like from the late 70s uh, films and the coloring and everything else. So it's kind of all tying into the, um, to the real story, really. Yeah. We have to turn this over. Because